Welcome to the West Bridgewater Community Access Television's Halloween special, Tales of the Bridgewater Triangle. We will explore what the Bridgewater Triangle and the Hockamock Swamp is, and with the help of a few guests, discuss locations in West Bridgewater. The Bridgewater Triangle refers to an area of about 200 square miles within southeastern Massachusetts, claimed to be a site of alleged paranormal phenomena, ranging from UFOs to poltergeist, orbs, balls of fire, and other spectral phenomena, various Bigfoot-like sightings, big snakes, and thunderbirds. Specific boundaries of the Bridgewater Triangle were first defined by cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman, who coined the term in the mid-1970s, and then in his book Mysterious America. He wrote that the Bridgewater Triangle encompasses the town of Abington to the north, Rehoboth to the southwest, and Freetown to the southeast are the points of the triangle. Historic places and landmarks that will dis be discussed in this West Bridgewater Community Access Television Halloween special will include the Hockamock Swamp, which means the place where spirits dwell, and the Solitude Stone, an inscribed stone located near Forestry in West Bridgewater, which was found near a missing person's body, also known as Suicide Stone. The rock was found with the inscription, All ye who is future days will walk the Nakatesset stream. Love not him who hummed this lay, cheerful to the parting beam, but the beauty that he wooed. Common paranormal claims to most areas in the Bridgewater Triangle is a mix of reported phenomena that includes reports of UFOs, mysterious animals and hominids, ghosts and poltergeists, and animal mutilations. There have been several reported sightings of a Bigfoot-like creature in the triangle, usually near the Huckmuck Swamp. Giant bergs or pterodactyl-like flying creatures with wingspans 8 to 12 feet are claimed to have been seen in the Huckmuck Swamp in neighboring Taunton, including a report by Norton Police Sergeant Thomas Downey. The Huckmuck Swamp is a vast wetland encompassing much of the northern part of southeastern Massachusetts. This 16,950-acre land is considered the largest freshwater swamp in the state. It acts as a natural flood control mechanism for the region. During the 17th century, the Huckmuck Swamp was used by the Wampanoag against invasion by early English settlers. It played a role in the King Philip's War as a strategic base of operations for Metacomet, also known as King Philip to launch assaults upon nearby English settlements. During the 18th and 19th centuries, Euro-American settlers attempted to drain it and convert it into profitable farmland. For centuries, the swamp served as a dual purpose for the natives, life-sustaining activities such as hunting and a sacred burial ground. The natives named it Hockamuck, the Algonquin term meaning place where spirits dwell. The Hockamuck is occasionally referred to as Hobomuck. The Wapanoag worshipped and feared Hobomuck, or Hobomuck, the chief deity of death and disease. Hobomuck, composed of human souls of the dead, was known to congregate in areas like the Hockamuck. Thus the terms Hockamuck and Hobomuck became interchangeable among non-natives when referring to the swamp and the spirit. There are many stories and legends that have become associated with the swamp, like strange creatures and entities, man birds, giant snakes, demon dogs, skeleton ghosts, and Bigfoot, described as a bear-like or ape-like, usually lumbering, towering, hairy, and stinky. Even in modern times, it has, for some, remained a place of mystery and fear. The paranormal enthusiast community considers the Huckamuck Swamp the heart of the Bridgewater Triangle. Before we dive into the reported paranormal phenomena of the Bridgewater Triangle, let's get into some history. I have someone with me who I've known for about a decade or so now, and that she has been researching the history of this area and the reports of the Bridgewater Triangle for probably even longer than that. Her name is Kristen Evans. So Kristen, what is your background in researching this area and into the Bridgewater Triangle? I began researching the area of the Bridgewater Triangle around 2008. 
and uh, um, initially it was a story that I read in Weird New England about a black dog terrorizing the town of Abington. Happened in 1976. I was seven, I was six years old at the time, and I remember being absolutely terrified by that story. And over the years, I'd ask people if they remembered it. Nobody remembered it. I started to think it was a figment of my imagination until I read the book, and there it was. I also, growing up in Hanson, had a lot of other strange, unexplained things happen to me. And then when I read about the Bridgewater Triangle for the first time, I thought, huh, there might be an answer for all of this. And it became a absolute passion and a curiosity that still hasn't ended. Let's go more localized. In West Bridgewater, who is Reverend Keith and what is his history in or with West Bridgewater? Okay, so Reverend Keith was born in Aberdeen, Scotland, and he was a Puritan minister. He moved to Mass Bay Colony in, I think, 1654, and there he met Increase Mather, um, most famous with his association of the Salem Witch Trial Hysteria. It was Increase Mather that brought Keith to Bridgewater, and that actually brought the power to Bridgewater. You couldn't have a town unless you had a minister. So they had a minister, and actually the Keith House still remains on River Street in West Bridgewater. Some believe it's haunted. It's the oldest parsonage in the United States and definitely one of the oldest standing homes in the United States. Some people link the Bridgewater Triangle to the King Philip's War. Can you briefly educate me on this event? Absolutely. King Philip's War started in 1675 was also known as Metacom's Rebellion, the Forgotten War, and it was a war that only lasted 14 months in this area, but there were still skirmishes as far north as Maine till about 1678. But a lot of crucial events happened right here in the Bridgewater Triangle. Just about every town in the Bridgewater Triangle was affected with the exception of Taunton. And that's because uh, King Philip was friends with um, the Leonard family, who were very prominent in the town and owned a stone forge. And he got a lot of supplies from them. They had very friendly relations. So with the exception of Taunton, just about every town was affected. And the effects were 52 towns were attacked and 12 towns were completely devastated. Not far into the war, there was a skirmish near Montponset Pond in Halifax. It was there that King Philip made an escape. Unfortunately, his wife and son were captured among about 150 prisoners. Um, and his wife and his son were held prisoner in the Keith House until they could decide what to do with them. Um, there was half of Plymouth Colony government wanted to behead him, but he was only 10 years old. It was Reverend Keith that came to his aid, and he used quotes from the Bible as his, as, as his defense on the morality of killing a 10-year-old child. Um, the house also served as a garrison for the war, which means they would take women and children and they would fortify the home. And that was one of the only houses in Bridgewater that was not burned to the ground. But most people considered the capture of King Philip and his death to be the end of the war. As far as history of this area, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, I think that King Philip's war probably has a lot to do with the negative energy in the Bridgewater Triangle but I wouldn't say it is the only cause. Uh, there's miles and miles and miles of very, very strange stone walls and chambers that seem to emit energy. And I wonder if, if that maybe has more to do with it than the war. But um, I know you travel to Gettysburg, correct? And Gettysburg times, yeah. is considered haunted because 
it was a battlefield, it was hollow ground. So if you want to go by that theory, then you'd have to look at the whole of the Bridgewater Triangle as perhaps hollow ground as well. The Raynham Park area of the Bridgewater Triangle is crisscrossed by railroad tracks and high-tension wires where paranormal phenomena like Bigfoot, UFOs, and balls of light have been very often seen. Also, strange cat creatures, enormous turtles, and huge shadowy dogs have been reported in this area. With me is Mark Carlicosis, who has been to the Raynham Park and did look for these spook lights. My name is Mark Carlicosis, as you said. I uh, go and do paranormal investigations with my friends. I've been out to the Random Tongue and Dog Track, the abandoned railroad behind it, skim milk all around the Bridgewater Triangle, all the real hot spots. I've uh, been into the paranormal since in search of way back in the 70s. And then with the, everything coming around about 2009, I really went in and started investigating. And I've been fortunate enough to get results on several occasions. When and where did you first hear about the Bridgewater Triangle? I first heard about it, my father told me when I was in college, about an article from Chris Pittman. So he printed it out for me, so I read that, and then I was really intrigued. But then with the, the um, popularity of all the ghost hunting shows on TV, I finally decided to go out, and I was fortunate to have results my first time. So. I've been in there since. How did you hear about the reports at, about paranormal phenomena at Random Park? About the dog track, I heard a little bit in that Chris, Par Chris Pittman article, but a lot of it was on the show Spooky South Coast. It's a podcast I listen to. And so that they talk about the Bridgewater Triangle on a regular basis, fortunately. So that gave me the information I needed to figure out what I'm looking for when I get out there. But it's one of the few places where They've seen everything out. You, you go out there looking for ghosts and you might come across Bigfoot. You might come across some other weird creature or even a UFO if you're lucky enough. So it's, it's very rich for that kind of um, searching. Another person's ghost is another person's Bigfoot, another person's. Exactly. <laughs> so you have investigated that area. How did you go about it? Did you use any equipment or any methods that we should know about? I did. I went out to the Random Tom dog, dog track behind there is the abandoned railroad, it goes right off of Route 106. So you go out, head south, and maybe a half mile out there, you'll see the high tension wires. And a little further past there, we were out there and we were you know, trying to get voices on a voice recorder. I had a couple K2 meters set up, that's an EMF detector. It'll um, measure electromagnetic field. The theory is that ghosts will use that to cross over. So we had a couple of those going, we were down there, down the path a little bit, the Abana Railroad, and we hear that if you take a large branch and you bang it off a tree, supposedly Bigfoot may answer back because it's one of the few animals that can do that. Although I don't know if anyone's actually seen a Bigfoot do it, how they got to that conclusion, but we figured we'd try. So I go out there, I'm banging on the tree, and you know there was no answer back. But when then I walked back, my K2 meter, the EMF detector, was moved slightly, and now the lights that were usually just one green light at the bottom were lit up halfway. So that was different. So then we moved my friend's EMF detector next to mine, and that was lit up halfway. So I said, all right, if there's a spirit nearby, can you light up just that one pointing to mine on the left? And it went all the way up. Then we said, can you light up just that one pointing to the right? And that went all the way up. And I said, can you light up both of them? And they both went up all the way. So that was pretty cool, but then it, that was all that you could do. It takes a lot of energy, supposedly, to cross over. So I was getting right in queue with the EMF detector, so I was pretty excited. Did you find anything or get any results into um, the spook lights or the lights that supposedly people I see? didn't see any spook lights, and I have my doubts about the spook lights because there's a lot of bugs out there, and with your flashlight or any kind of animal, the lights are going to be red with a flashlight, so that's what I think the spook lights are going down there. It's probably just moss or something. I've never seen it, but if I do, it's usually January when that comes around anyway. And yeah. It's always a lot of snow out there and stuff to get out there. It's very difficult. What do you think is the theory behind the phenomena there? Do you think the spook lights are related to the Bigfoot phenomena? I don't think so. No. And see, there's a lot of stories about the Bigfoot in the Bridgewater area, the Hockamock Swamp area. 
I have my doubts. Lately, there's been a lot of big fight, Bigfoot sightings, more in the fall, but that's also around hunting season. And nowadays, guys go hunting with ghillie suits, like the snipers use, and so it kind of looks like a Bigfoot if you see the silhouette. So the modern day, that's what I think it was. Now, I know of a story back in the 70s, in East Bridgewater, I believe it was, that a, a couple police officers were at the end of a road and they were just talking in their cruiser, and supposedly Bigfoot lifted up the rear end of the police cruiser and they couldn't get away. Turns out it's a friend of mine's father that actually did it. Unfortunately, he passed in 1993, so I can't talk to him about it. So I don't think that was a sniper in a ghillie suit back in, in uh, probably the 70s when that occurred, and no guy could lift up the rear end of a police cruiser, so that's something else. So I heard you visited Skimmook Bridge. Is there any reported paranormal phenomena there? Yeah, there's lots actually. Um, people hear like the coach going over the, the rocks on the bridge. You can hear that going by. People hear the guys on the riding the horses saying, yeah, and all that to get them over and, not, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the only thing I ever got was a little flooded with the EMF detector. Um, there was a psychic with us and she said that they were spirits of like settlers telling us to get out of there because the Indians in the area were bad and all that kinds of stuff. But I didn't get any of that. Um, I don't think we've got any voice recorders going on that trip. No, there weren't. But uh, it was just some EMF detector, that kind of thing. And, and that whole Hockamock Swamp area and everything connected to it, if you've ever been out there, or if not, try it. But it feels like you're being watched the whole time. So that's weird. Like I've been in other woods and it's peaceful, but you go to the Hockamock Swamp and you, you could almost picture Native Americans, the Wampanoag just running across the path or settlers going the other way. It's, just, it's bizarre, but you definitely feel like there's something out there. It's pretty cool. Any else happened there that you wanted to talk about? On the Skin Milk Bridge, unfortunately, no, there wasn't a lot. That's another spot all along the stream that people have seen those spook lights, we'll say. Um, I know in the way back, there was a woman that she got a, a, a canoe and she went out there and she was missing for days. They couldn't find her. They found the canoe and everything was dry in the canoe, so she hadn't flipped it over, but she was just gone out of the canoe. And then a couple of days later, they found her body under the skin milk bridge. So I'm sure there's a lot of hauntings right from that as well. Is there anything else you would like to add about the dog track or Skin Milk Bridge or the Hockamock Swamp? Um, well, the Hockamock Swamp, the Skin Milk Bridge, the water that goes from the Hockamock goes right through under the Skin Milk Bridge all the way out to the Nip, Lake Nipponicket. And that's very haunted as well. People, that's another sighting where people see Bigfoot and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's off the road, so that could easily, um, some kind of creature could easily go down there. And then that goes out to the Taunt River from the Nip and the Ton River, all kinds of weird stuff has been seen out there. There's been an island that they, uh, there was a Wampanoag um, burial ground out on one of the islands. And so they exhumed the bodies and this red ochre came out and none of the pictures developed, which is usual for the paranormal for some reason. Photography is always difficult. Grassy Island right next to um, Dighton Rock. Correct, exactly. So that's pretty cool. And again, that's all connected. And that goes right out to the ocean. And people have seen a beluga whale out there. And that was just like three years ago. Lots of gators have been found out there. Um, there was a couple alligators and stuff have been seen out there as well. So it's, there's a lot that goes on in the Taunton River. And it feeds right in a paranormal as well as just not normal. The Route 24 and Route 106 area of the Bridgewater Triangle crisscrosses the Huckamook Swamp, where paranormal phenomena such as UFOs have been witnessed. Also, on the western side of 24 near the West Bridgewater Southern Boundary is the Indian campsite and a burial ground. With me is Kristen Evans again, who knows the story behind the UFOs in the Bridgewater Triangle. When and where did you first hear about the Bridgewater Triangle? Growing up in Hanson, I had a lot of strange encounters. I saw lights in the sky. One night I was driving down the street and something hit my car. I thought it was a rock. 
I had to pull over. And to my shock, my entire windshield was covered in, of all things, yolk. And there are pieces of shell about this big all over my car, all over the front of my car. And all I could think of was dinosaur egg. So I went to bed. The next morning, my mother said, you're never going to believe what happened last night. My friend and I were sitting outside in the backyard when all of a sudden we started hearing crashes. We ran out and Kristen, we saw a pterodactyl. I swear to God. And I laughed. <laughs> of course, I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, it had dangly legs. It was massive. It was crashing through the trees. The trees are still broken if you want to go see. So that happened around 10 o'clock and when the egg dropped on my car, it was around 1.30, but it was not more than an eighth of a mile apart. Another time I was driving down the street around 5.30 in the morning going to work, and I saw this thing go across the road, which was definitely not human. It was definitely not animal. It was made of like a neon light, and it was moving in a geometric pattern, and it just like scurried across the street. Um, those are just a few things that happened when growing up, and I had no idea there was a name for this area, and it's called the Bridgewater Triangle, so I am definitely not alone in growing up in this area and having strange experiences. When did you hear about the reports of UFOs in the Bridgewater Triangle? Um, right away, really. Um, when I first started my research, um, and UFOs are something that is one of my biggest interests in the, in the Bridgewater Triangle. So I really, really, really delved into research, researching them back a hundred years even. Um, so obviously this area is very well known for UFOs, I'd say. UFO phenomena and Bigfoot sightings are probably the biggest interest in, in the Bridgewater Triangle. So in the 60s, there was a lot of mass sightings, meaning hundreds of people saw ships in the sky. Kind of died down for a while. Early 70s, it happened again. People were seeing these silver, massive ships in the sky. Um, then kind of died down again, and then in 1979, there was a UFO sighting right at the corner of Route 106 and Route 24 at the edge of Hockamock Swamp that is undoubtedly the most famous sighting in the Bridgewater Triangle. Um, the ship was massive. It was described to be as big as a football field, or another witness said if you took four or five 747s and put them next to each other. That's how big it was. That was another sighting hundreds of people saw. Um, two newscasters actually saw it from WHDH. And they were driving to the Raynham Taunton dog track. Just as they were exiting Route 24, they noticed an extremely bright light from above them. So when they got on Route 106, which was very, very dark at the time, no, you know, probably one gas station, no alehouse, no Charlie horse, it was pitch black. And they kind of slowed down and, and looked up and noticed that this thing was hovering over them. They kept going and they got to a stoplight and then they decided both to poke their heads out and they just saw this thing was like, absolutely monstrous. It was blocking the sky. And not just them, everybody behind them was doing the same. I've actually seen UFOs in the Bridgewater Triangle, but very, very, very much at a distance. The ones that I've seen are called like the fireball type. They look like planets or stars. They move erratically. They appear, disappear. Um, and, and those are probably the most predominant UFOs that people have seen in the last decade. But um, I can't imagine the fear that these people must have felt when they were encountering something that until then was science fiction and it was becoming science fact for them. Um, another interesting 
witness to that was a person that lived at the edge of the Hockamock Swamp. Her description was, it looked just like a ship from Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and she maintains that it actually landed in Hockamock Swamp. What is your theory uh, of UFOs? Do you think it's beings from another planet, or do you think it's us, human race, from, from the future? That's an excellent question. Or it could just be government technology that we are not, you know, at liberty to know, you know, for good reasons. I would say that it's, it's probably a mixture of both. A mixture of all three? Yep. I hear you have some information about Cochise Cemetery. Can you tell me more about that cemetery? Sure. It is that little cemetery right before you get to the Route 106 exit off of Route 24, really exactly where the newsmen had their sighting. There's a cemetery there, which is just the headstones. No bodies, because the bodies are actually on Route 24. When they built Route 24, they just removed the headstones and left the bodies like poltergeist. Since you're here, can you tell us your knowledge of the Comfort Bridge in Solitude Stone? Sure, that is one of my favorite stories. Um, in 1916, there was a missing woman who had gone missing while she had rented a canoe and she was going down the Tom River. And she was missing for a few days. They ended up finding her body and they presumed that she drowned. But during the search, a reporter was sitting on a bridge called Comfort Bridge, which is no longer there, but it was made of stone. It actually would look a lot like skim, skim milk bridge. It was made out of stones, and um, a reporter was taking a break, sitting at the edge of the bridge, having a cigarette, when he was just kind of scratching at moss on, on a rock, and he noticed that there was writing on the rock. It ended up being a poem. It took 80 years for people to figure out who actually wrote the poem. And it turned out to be Reverend Timothy Otis Payne. Timothy Otis Payne was integral in the philosophies of Freemasonry. Um, the Temple of Solomon is extremely important to the Freemasons and one of his works was recreating from biblical dimensions Solomon's temple. And the Freemasons to this day use that as a resource. He's absolutely intriguing. Not only was he the minister of the New Church of Jerusalem, he was also the number one to-go guy to interpret hieroglyphics. He also interpreted into English, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, took frequent visits to Cairo to, um, he was an archeologist. And there's also other rocks around with his markings. And I wonder why he took all this time to carve these poems onto rocks to have no recognition. They weren't supposed to be found by just anyone. Um, in my opinion, the one on Comfort Bridge was found by accident, and if Evelyn Packard hadn't gone missing, they never would have found it. After a lecture a few years ago, I was approached by three older women, and they actually were relatives of Timothy Otis Payne, and family legend has it that there are many other rock, rocks in Hockamock Swamp. And I was very surprised to hear that they had the same philosophy that I had, that they mean something, they are marking something. Whether they're ley lines, energy points, tragic events, who knows. But they, be they believe the same thing I did. In the Bridgewater Triangle, there are reports of haunted institutions, schools and hospitals, travel paths, trails, roads and train tracks, and of course, cemeteries. One of these reported haunted cemeteries resides in West Bridgewater, very close to the proximity of the intersection of Route 24 and 106. Here with me to get the lowdown on one of these cemeteries is Lynn Hunt. Lynn, what is your paranormal background? How did you get started? What's your experience in the field? I think 
from, for a lot of people, uh, there was a program that I be began back in 2004. I think a lot of people watched it on TV, Ghost Hunters. Um, we started watching that, I think like a lot of other people. And we're very fortunate, I think from that point on, to meet, uh, meet some people that, that do this all the time, uh, meet some of the stars of the show, become friends with some people that, uh, that are on TV and so forth that involved the paranormal and uh, just kind of went from there. When and where did you first hear about the Bridgewater Triangle? I think anybody that has anything to do with the paranormal anywhere in this area anyway learned about, uh, knows about the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, so a long time ago, probably 15 years ago, we, we, we knew about it. 15 years ago. How did you come to know this specific cemetery? Well, back in the days when I was fire chief, uh, I had some people that knew um, what, I, what we did, my wife and I did for, a, I guess, a hobby, you'd call it, and you know, approached me one day when I was uh, at the town hall and said, you know, Chief, uh, are you aware of, uh, of this location? And I, and I said, yeah, I had heard uh, things before. And they said, well, you know, we recently were there and we thought that there's other things going on there besides just the normal everyday occurrences. Is there, do you know people, is there anybody you can get a hold of that could actually go in there and check it out and, and let you know what's going on? And I did, so uh, I made some contacts and we've been up and looked at it a couple of times. What is the reported paranormal phenomena in the cemetery? Um, apparitions, you know, uh, ghosts, if you will. It's being seen by people walking around in the cemetery. So, uh, you know, whether or not they're residents, if you will, or uh, people just passing through, they haven't said, but that was the original report, yeah. Did you have any personal experiences you'd like to share? I've never had a personal experience there um, in, all, in the multiple times that I've been there. Uh, I've never had a personal experience, but I've, I've been there, I've brought people there, again, that know a lot more about this than I do, and they've had experiences, so. What, can you name the, what kind of experiences? Um, just, just more, I, I had one, uh, one person that, that uh, is a medium, and uh, she, she felt that there were at least five other entities there that she, she saw. Um, I was there with another uh, medium that uh, thought there was more of a, uh, what do I wanna say, uh, elemental, if you will, uh, influence there. So you get, you know, depending on, the, on who the medium is, you get different uh, influence. Do you have any advice for people who would like to check out locations like these in or other location search of the paranormal? I would, I, first of all, I would never tell anybody to go into any cemetery at night. I mean, uh, not only are you, I'm very, I'm very respectful of, uh, of, especially of cemeteries, so I, I would tell anybody who, uh, who wants to do paranormal investigations, if you will, to contact the people that are affiliated with the area before they go into any, whether it's a cemetery or a building or, or anything like that. I mean, we, I've, I've been into different buildings throughout the area and it was always with permission. It was always with another, you know, with a group that had permission to be there. So I would, I'd be very careful. It's not something you just uh, dive into. Have you had any other paranormal experiences in West Bridgewater or the Hockamock Swamp area? We had an experience. We were at the uh, we were at the town park one night and uh, and and had a had an experience uh, in there with uh, what we thought was an apparition walking through the town park. But there again, you're talking about a piece of property that goes back to the uh, 1600s, so it's almost inevitable. Before letting you go, do you have anything else to say on the subject of the paranormal? I think I would just go back to, it's not something that to take lightly. If it's something you're interested in doing, there are plenty of people out there that, that know how to do it and, uh, and do it the right way. So I would contact, uh, you know, I would contact them. There's, there's usually, if you go online on Facebook, for instance, there are 
there are a lot of people that, I won't say advertise, but offer to teach you how to do it. Um, my wife and I work, uh, volunteer I should say, for an organization in Middleborough at the uh, Oliver Estate in Middleborough. Um, and we, we do, uh, down there we do haunted you know, investigations and so forth teach people how to use equipment and so forth. So I'm not saying you necessarily have to come see us, but that's who I, I those are the kind of people that I would contact before I just went off and did it on your own because it's not, it's not something to take lightly. Well, I enjoyed getting to know the locations that my guests provided information for and hope you have as well. If you do get the bug to explore these or any other location, please get permission be respectful to your surroundings and leave it as you found it, and don't ruin it for future explorers. On behalf of the West Bridgewater TV, we wish all of you a safe and happy Halloween.